Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Louis Lee with the First African Baptist Church here in Goldsboro, North Carolina, where our theme is encouraging hearts, changing lives, and saving souls. God is a blessed God, and we certainly thank him for his grace and his mercy. I thank him for the privilege and the honor of being able to share with you today. Can't promise I'm gonna be long. I'm still recovering a little bit, and still my breath is not quite with me yet after I dealt with a, a brief COVID battle, but God is a good God, and he's worthy to be praised. So we're gonna go through this the best we can, and God's gonna bless and it's gonna make a way, and I know that he's gonna bring a word that's gonna help you. But we're out of Acts, the ninth chapter. So we've dealt with the early book of Acts, and we talked about the early church and how God is using the early church as a model of what we should be like. And nothing better than, than being organic and connected to the roots. You want fresh food, you go from farm to the table. If you want the freshest, pro, the freshest meats and the freshest things, you connect with the local farm and you have it where you don't have to go through all the processing that, that our stuff go through. And that's how you get the freshest stuff. When you, whenever you dilute something, then you lose the value and efficacy of what that power can be given. And so the same thing with the church. If we want to know how the church is to be functioning, how she is to carry power, how she is to be an agent of healing, and an agent of truth during these difficult times. There's nothing more authentic than to go back to the word of God and see how God would deal with manners. And this is not just in the manner when we're in the physical confines of the church, but everything we do in life, if we line it up with the word of God, it will open up a door and it will show us whether we are walking in the light of God. For example, when we deal with public events on the news, we deal with things in the media, trials and courthouse issues and all of those things, our responsibility as Christians is not to see what, what the mainstream media is looking at, is not to see black and white, is not to see all of the things of this world. Let's look at this situation. How would Jesus Christ address that situation? And when we do those things, then everything else will fall in order because the scripture says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will come to pass. So when we get into the will of God, then, then we, we, we can follow it and we know we're walking on the right track. I vote based on how Jesus would deal with that issue. I stand based on what Jesus would stand based on that issue. That's why as a man today, I don't belong to anybody because my connection and my belonging is to Jesus Christ and his righteousness, and that's our responsibility. If we want to be the church without spot or wrinkle, we need to be the church that's the most connected to God's holy word. How much do we know about God? As much as we know about his word. How much do we trust God? As much as we trust his word. How much do we love God? As much as we love his word. You have to have the word of God to grow in an abiding faith in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So moving right along, we've got that established. Let's go on. So Acts the ninth chapter, beautiful transition right here going in the chat. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told into the and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. <clears throat> Lord, 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 Lord. Look at that thing. Look, look at this. Well, I got to go one more time and see it. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I mean, if ever there was a time when we saw the Lord's attention was fully captivated, Saul right here, he captured the Lord's attention. And I want to talk to you today about what matters to Christ. What matters to Christ? Often we give this text as if this was completely centered 
around what, what's going on within the life of Saul and his conversion. But the beauty of it is Saul was actually the second central figure in this particular text because it was God's protective hand and God's loving hand that caused God to extend his love to Saul and to stop what was happening during this particular time right here. So as we look at it right here now, and it says, again, I'm gonna just, let me pray for a little bit. Dear Lord, we thank you. We praise you and we magnify your holy name. Bless and move and have your way, Father. Touch in a mighty way. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus the Christ we pray, amen. And so right here now, when naturally Saul, so this is the same Saul of Tarshish or the Apostle Paul that we later learned out in, in the New Testament that was responsible for God using to author two thirds of the New Testament. But during this time, the church was under significant persecution. I mean, the church was under torrid persecution of what was going on and all of the things that were happening in the body of Christ. And God moved right here and God began to show it. Paul or Saul, I'm sorry, I'm going to stay with Saul. Saul of Tarshish, look at what it says. So he was working right now and there were a lot of players that were in this text. And Saul, he was an agent of the government, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. Now, whenever you got somebody breathing out threatenings and slaughter, and you're breathing out cruelties against the disciples of the Lord, you already know that you're on the wrong side. So whether you don't know what's the right side or the wrong side in this text, the person that's breathing out the threatenings and breathing out the cruelty and pushing out all the hate, you already know who's on the wrong side. He's pushing out threatenings against the disciples of the Lord. Power of the tongue is so important. The power of how we treat one another is so important. The power of how we deal with one another is so important. No matter what this world throw at us, we have a responsibility to give back love. No matter what happens in our lives, we must administer forgiveness. No matter what we go through in life, we have to be representatives of God. And so right here, before we even saw the rest of the full text, we knew that Saul was fighting a losing battle because he was breathing out threatenings against the disciples of the Lord. How could he win in this text? Even if we didn't get such a grandiose change and we know a major conversion happened after this text because we know the end of the story. But how could he expect to win when he was breathing out cruelties and slaughter, murder against the disciples of the Lord? So Saul was proposing to be working for the government. Saul was working for a Jewish-based government that was strictly bound by the law of Moses. And so the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill. And yet he comes out and he's breathing out threatenings and slaughtering against the disciples of the Lord. So you claim to be working for the law of the Lord and you're taking the law of the Lord and you're breathing out plans to murder the disciples of the Lord. So when does the Lord step in this picture? When does your allegiance to the Lord come into the picture right here? So he then he said, went unto the high priest. Now, it's one thing to be a renegade rogue and want to show off. It's one thing to be a bad apple in the midst of a church body and you want to show off and have it your way all the time. It's one thing to be somebody that, that, that just want to create controversy and stir up stuff and I'm going to have it my way and I'm mean and I like it that way. And that's one thing because God can deal with you and he'll deal with you swiftly. And so the battle is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. But what do you do when Saul went to the high priest? How do you deal when not only are the members corrupted, but the leaders are corrupted also? How do you expect something good to come about when the people are confused and the preacher confused himself also? And so right here, not only was Saul the, the, the high leader, the, the, the worker of the government, not only was he confused, but the leader was confused also. And so he said, so Saul desired letters of him that he could go into Damascus, into the synagogues, and if he found any in the way 
And look at how the devil works with you now. So not only normally if you dealt with the man in the house, you set the house in order. It, it was a rule of engagement and it's still a rule of engagement today that women and children were considered sacred. And that was not a ground that you touched with and you dealt with. But lo and behold, as we look right here in the text, Saul wanted to get the women, the men, he wanted to bring them all out and bound them up into Jerusalem. And that, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to drag them out of the houses. And by the fact that he was going and on this mission tells me that the high priest granted him the letters that he desired. So when we're looking at how to get God's attention, we see so many things that are wrong. The first thing is there was a threat to kill the people of God. The second thing was God cares about mankind and family more than God loves anything. God doesn't love pews more than he loves families. God is not in love with Mercedes Benz and Lexus and Jaguar and Range Rover more than he loves families. God is not enamored with silver and gold and rubies and houses and land and stock and Bitcoin more than he loves family. God loves family more than anything. There's nothing more precious in the eyesight of God than a man and woman that are standing up living for the Lord and trying to raise their family to know God and know that he is Savior, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God loves family more than anything because strong Christians make strong families and strong families make strong churches and strong churches make strong communities and strong communities make strong nations and strong nations make strong tabernacles to worship the Lord God Almighty. So it starts with God loving man. So when we deal with it right here, so it says, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Now Saul could have went anywhere and he might would have had some temporary false success. But by the fact that he went to Damascus was one of the central reasons that Jesus Christ stood up once again and said, let me go deal with Saul. Because Damascus was not an ordinary region. Damascus was not an ordinary circumstance. Damascus was not an ordinary branch of worship. Damascus was not an ordinary place where they gathered to sing about the praises of the Lord. But Damascus was the holding ground that when a new believer was brought into the body of Christ, they often would pull them out of Jerusalem and take them to Damascus. And that's where the apostles would gather with the new Christians. And they were teaching them about the basics of knowing who God was and what Jesus did for them. And so God could deal with Saul and all of the high government whooping up on Stephen. God, God could deal with them dealing with Philip. You called to be a digging. That's part of the challenge that you got to stand up for the Lord. God could deal with them beating up on John and Peter and Bartholomew and Thomas. You guys walked with the Lord and you were his original apostles. You, you, you got, you, you, it's part of the territory that every now and then you're going to suffer persecution for the name of the Lord. There's not time in the body of Christ for a cowardly preacher or a cowardly digging. That's not defined in scripture, but if you're gonna serve under those calls, you got to have courage and be willing to stand up for God. So God can deal with you beating up on them. That really wasn't the big issue right here at the table. But when they went to Damascus to deal with the new converts that had just got to know God, something got awakened in Jesus Christ. We sing the song, Jesus loved the little children. All God's children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. Jesus loved the little children of the world. For years we've been singing that as an anthem in Sunday schools and vacation Bible schools and youth gatherings to let the children know that Jesus loved the little children and he's got the whole world in his hands. He got the little bitty babies in his hands and all of our lives we thought that God was talking just about the little bitty young kids and the little babies and yes he was talking about them 
but God was also talking about that new person that is just giving their heart to Jesus and he was letting the world know that you better act right in the presence of new believers. You better treat new folks in the gospel right. Whether somebody is 14 or whether they 44, if they come into your house and say, I need to be forgiven. I've been mixed up in drugs and big liquor and I need to be set free. I've been homeless and I need somebody to call my own. I've been messed up in prostitution and running drugs and I need somebody to take me in. God said we got a special responsibility. Don't be turning up your nose at folks when they knew in the body of Christ. Don't be guesstimating why people fall into situations that they've gotten themselves in. But when you see that situation, just fall on your knees and say, God, what must I do to help my brother along? I don't want to be a stumbling block to a new believer. We spend all of our time fussing in church, arguing about money, arguing about why you do this and who made this decision and what authority does the pastor have to make this call. We better get right and set the tone of worship and stop arguing one with another and start glorifying the name of the Lord because we are setting an example to the new world that's new in the faith and when Saul was beating up on Jerusalem, God said they can handle it. When Saul was working up the diggings, God said I'm not worried about my brothers. They can handle it. When Saul was beating up on the apostles, God said I'm going to step back for a while. They got it. They know the mysteries of the truth. They can handle it. But when he went and messed with the brand new believers, those weak folks that were trying to turn their life around. God said enough of that. I'm going to step in. He knocked him off of his horse. Saul said, my Lord, my Lord, what will you have me to do? God said, Je listen what Jesus said. Who art thou Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. So for folk that think you can have God without Jesus, Saul cried out to the Lord, but he heard an answer for Jesus. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God over all. So when he called upon that one God, that one true and living God, when he called upon Yahweh, when he called upon Elohim, when he called upon Jah, when he called upon Jehovah Jireh, he was waiting for an answer. And Jehovah Jireh said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, but it also told me that when a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, give their life to Jesus Christ, that Jesus takes control. When Saul was out there persecuting the new believers, he thought he was messing with people, but when the Lord spoke, he said, I am Jesus and thou persecute me. When you mess with somebody that's trying to break addictions, you're messing with Jesus. When we laugh at somebody because they don't have their dress right, we're messing with Jesus. When we fight against the preacher and try to discourage the word from going forth, we're not messing with the preacher, we're messing with Jesus. When we mess against the folks of the body of Christ with no word to back up our claim, just what we believe, what our traditions and what we want, we are persecuting the body of Jesus Christ. He didn't say, Paul or Saul, you're messing with my children. He said, I am Jesus and thou persecuted me, but I got good news for you. It is mighty hard to kick against the pricks. You can kick all day, but you can't tear it down. And trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? The Lord can turn the devil around. The Lord can make that which is wrong right. The Lord can fix that which is unjust and bring justice on every side. And he said, go into that city and I'll tell you what to do. Don't you know that the stone that the builder rejected has now become the chief cornerstone? The same folk that Saul persecuted are the same folks he got to go back to and lift up the name of the Lord. The same ones that he persecuted are the same ones he got to go back to and learn about the way of the Lord. If you want to get God's attention, you mess with the body of Christ. If you want to get Jesus' attention, keep on messing with God. God's children. So this was a powerful lesson to me. 
God, Jesus, my Lord, did not stand up for trees. He did not stand up for the earth and the land and the skies. But when the young children of God were being persecuted, he said, why dost thou persecute me? Sometime as a believer, my heart just burns. Sometime I say, why in the world does slavery still exist in the world? Jesus said, I'm going to deal with it because when they enslave children, they are enslaving me. I said, how could child trafficking and all of this sex trafficking and all of these kids that are lost all over the world and people are kidnapping and trafficking babies every day? And Jesus told me in that text, Keep on praying and keep on standing for right. But they're not messing with those babies. They're messing with me. I keep saying, how could people be so disenfranchised? And why is there so much hatred and hurt in the world today? And Jesus is saying, don't keep on praying and living right and speaking right. But let me tell you that they are persecuting me. So when you want to get Jesus' attention, treat the people of God wrong. And you will see Jesus standing tall and mighty. Saul said, Lord, and he said, I am Jesus, and I'm crying out today, Lord, and his name is Jesus. I need a savior. His name is Jesus. I need a friend. His name is Jesus. I need strength in my life. His name is Jesus. With all of the events that were happening <coughs> in the early church, it was when Saul spoke against the children of God that Jesus stood up, stopped the madness, and said, why dost thou persecute me? Keep on living right for Jesus. Make sure your life aligns with the Bible and the word of God. Make sure your messaging, everything that proceeds out of your mouth is rooted in scriptures and nothing else. Can't be rooted in culture, can't be rooted in race, can't be rooted in politics. Make sure it's rooted in scriptures and nothing else. And Jesus will stand up on your behalf. And when the devil want to call out and say, who is there blocking me? The Jesus will stand up on your behalf and say, I am Jesus. And why dost thou persecute me? What a mighty God we serve. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your protection, to be your guide, to take total control of your life. Why not today? Open up your hearts and let Jesus take total control. He's a way-making God. He's an awesome God. And he's worthy to be praised. So all you have to do is open up your hearts. And today, pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for forgiving me. And today, take total control of my life. Dear Jesus, I want to be your child, and I desire that you be my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you believe within your heart that Jesus Christ has forgiven you for your sins, well, today you are saved and you are now protected by the shield of God. Please connect with your local church. If there's someone in your family that loves Christ, that's setting a good example, connect with that person and ask, what, what, what are my next steps? What must I do? If you're without a church home and you desire for me to help administer you closer, I'll be glad to share with you and help you along your way. Just There's an email address at the bottom of this channel. Feel free to send me an email and I'll respond back to you in person within 48 hours and help you grow in grace that God will bless you and be with you every step of the way. Thank you so much and may God bless you.